Right, good morning everybody. So I can see that the numbers are slowing down. Um, welcome to the UCL Medical School Virtual Open Day for 2022. It's fantastic to see so many of you here bright and early on Thursday morning if you are in the UK and welcome to those of you that are across the rest of the world. My name is Sarah Bennett. I am the admissions tutor for the medicine degree programme at UCL Medical School. I'm also the deputy programme lead, and so I get involved in all aspects of the programme. Um, I'm joined today by lots of my colleagues and some of our fantastic medical students who are all here to answer your questions and to try and help uh, demystify the process, alleviate any of those worries that you might have about applying to medical school. It's a brilliant career, and I really think it's a great thing for you to apply for. So as you may be aware in a Q&A session like this, there is the option to write and type some questions. So if you just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, you will be able to type some questions in there. I'm going to start off the session with a, a brief presentation just to outline the entry requirements to medical school here at UCL and a little bit about the medical school itself. But whilst I'm doing that, please feel free to type in some questions and my colleagues will be answering in the background. And in about half an hour, we'll go into the um, the in-person Q&A part of it, uh, where we'll choose some of those questions to answer live. Brilliant. OK, so let's get started. So first and foremost, it would be great to know who we have here. So uh, Kate, if you wouldn't mind putting up the first poll, it would be great to know where are you joining us from? Um, so you just need to click on that poll. Are you in the UK? Are you in London? Are you outside of, of the UK, in Europe or overseas? You can scroll down. There are several options there. So if you don't see your option there, just scroll down a little bit further. Um, whether you're in the devolved nations, great to see somebody from Wales. Lovely to see you. We've got a few from over in Asia. Goodness me, what time is it over there? And Australasia too. Brilliant. And the Americas. Lovely. And quite a few of you in England, in and outside of London. Fabulous. OK, well, that's really helpful to see. Um, so we are going to move on to some quick questions. So the next poll question, how many medical schools are there actually in the UK? So, Kate, if you can put the next poll up. A little bit of a tricky question, this one, isn't it? Do you know? OK, brilliant. So I'm going to end the poll there. So those of you that chose 44, you were absolutely correct. So over the last few years, there has been an expansion in the number of medical schools across the UK. We had an extra 1500 places um, in about four years ago now. So we've got seven and a half thousand places across the UK, but that's spread across 44 different medical schools. I will be the first to say that all those medical schools are absolutely brilliant. So wherever you go to, to study medicine in the UK, you will get a fantastic education where you will meet the GMC's outcomes for graduates and you will hopefully work as a foundation doctor at the end of the programme within the UK itself. Um, so there are quite a few to choose from. So do do your research and do have a look at all of those medical schools, look at their entry requirements and look at um, the type of course that they have, the size of the medical school that can help you make a decision about where you want to study. Fabulous. And so one last question. Let's think specifically about our own medical school. So when did University College London Hospital start training doctors? This is a, a slightly more difficult one, isn't it? So lots of you have looked at our website already. Brilliant. 
Well done. So I'll end that poll there. So yes, it was 1834. So well done to the 13 of you that got that correct. So we are a historic medical school. We've been going for a long time, but we are a combination of three medical schools that are, are all fairly old and fairly long standing. So the Middlesex Hospital actually opened in 1746 and that was based on Good Street and um, that is now closed down has been subsumed into our medical school um, at UCL um, and we have also um, subsumed the Royal Free Hospital School of Medicine as well um, which was opened um, just after that. So it was opened in 1828. Um, and we're very proud of the history of UCL, of it being the first um, hospital, UCLH, to be opened in combination with a university to train doctors, to be the first um, medical school at the Royal Free to accept women, um, and to be the first university, UCL, that accepted students regardless of their background. Um, and I think that those are values that we continue to hold. Brilliant. OK, thank you for answering those. I, hopefully that's got you started. So you may well have looked on our website and we have a particular brand of UCL doctor, a highly competent, obviously, a scientifically literate clinician. So we are a multi-faculty institution. We provide what is known as a research-based education. There is a lot of research that is going on across the university. There's not a day that goes by where you perhaps don't see UCL mentioned in the news um, or on the television, uh, giving their opinion about some of the, the active research that is going on in, in this institution. But we also recognise that you need to be very person centred as a doctor and that medicine is changing rapidly. We know that over the last few years with the COVID pandemic, how quickly we've managed to come up with a vaccine. Um, at UCLH, there was the discovery of a new um, CPAP machine to deliver oxygen to patients who had COVID and were very unwell with it. And so we are at the forefront of that. And we feel that the foundations of basic medical sciences by having the early years of the programme really does benefit you in terms of then doing an integrated BSc and moving forwards with evidence based practice. So scholarship, as well as professionalism, is incredibly important as part of a medicine degree programme. And we hope that that will equip you to, to be able to manage and to see patients from a wide variety of different backgrounds. And that's the, the blessing of, of medicine, the, the real privilege of medicine, is the fact that you meet so many different people from all walks of life. And I just hope that you are interested in people. That's what medicine is all about, is having an interest in, in what people um, are doing. And we have a six year course at UCL. Um, and that is because we do have the compulsory integrated BSc that all students will take in year three, unless you're coming to us as a graduate already in possession of a degree. It's a systems based course. So as you can see in year one and year two at the top there, we go through each of the body systems to learn about the biochemistry, the physiology, the pharmacology, the pathology of each of those systems all in one. And it's integrated in that we do have some clinical and professional practice that goes right across the whole programme. So even in year one and two, you will have some shadowing experiences. You will see some patients as part of your clinical and professional practice teaching. And we will really focus on the fundamentals of, of clinical practice that underpin the basic medical sciences. So when you get into year three, there is the IBSC, where you can choose from around 20 different IBSC programmes um, and you'll apply for that in year two. And we feel that that gives you a really good grounding for then going on to evidence based practice in year four, five and six. So year four and five, you're starting your apprenticeship. You're learning to think and act like doctors over the course of those three years. You'll rotate around a number of different hospitals and trusts in central London and outside of London as well. It's really important that as medical students that you have lots of different experiences in different hospitals, in different community based practices so that you have a wide range of different um, experiences with patients. And then year six, we prepare you for clinical practice because you'll go straight into clinical practice once you have ended the programme. 
And as I mentioned, clinical and professional practice, CPP, runs throughout the six years of our program. We have 16 different modules that are covered within that. Things like ethics and law, clinical communication skills, clinical skills, uh, um, thinking about doctor as a data scientist, thinking about the NHS as a whole. I'm really giving you that basis of professionalism that is needed to work in a healthcare setting. So everyone's going to ask, well, why come to UCL over any of those other 43 different medical schools across the UK? Well, what is unique about us? Well, we, we are in central London. And so that does afford us the, the accessibility to a lot of different really specialised hospitals in central London and around Bloomsbury. Um, and so students will have short, short rotations around many of those to get experiences in, in some world leading institutions. And that also means that you will be taught by world leading clinicians as well. The course structure that we still have a um, a course where you are in the early years focusing on basic medical sciences and then moving on to the later years of your clinical apprenticeship and we really do focus on the vertical modules of CPP. We have a very wide range of IBSCs for students both clinical and non-clinical so you can choose from things like physiology, pharmacology, neuroscience that you study in the early years and take that to the BSc level or you can choose to study something like paediatrics and child health, sports and exercise medicine, women's health, clinical sciences. And we also have our own MBPhD programme. So after year three, if you want to take your research based practice further, um, then you can apply to the MBPhD programme where after you've done your first clinical year, you can spend an additional four years studying research in depth to gain a PhD as well as your MBBS. So you can spend 10 years with us at medical school if you wish. And a handful of students choose to do that every year um, because they want to focus perhaps on an academic medical career in the future. UCL is a large multi-faculty institution, so we have the arts, the humanities, the sciences, education in UCL, so you will be integrating with people doing a number of different programmes, um, and that means that you also have access to student selected components that are within um, the Slade Arts School, that you can go and experience lab-based practice in other departments, um, and we have other BSCs that are available to you as well. So we have around 45,000 students at UCL, both undergraduates and postgraduates as well. Um, and so I went to UCL Medical School and I found that that was a real bonus for me that I was meeting people from all different specialty areas. As I mentioned, UCL's research reputation, so you will be taught by those that are at the pinnacle of their research career um, and at the forefront of what is going on in clinical practice. But I think one of the things for me in particular are our students. We often find that the students that come to UCL are very collaborative. They are the UCL disruptive thinkers. They want to get involved in things that are going on at the university and they want to work together. And that's so important for a career in healthcare where you're going to be working in clinical teams every single day. And so having that peer support, but also learning together and with each other is incredibly important part of our ethos at UCL. OK, so now I've convinced you that UCL hopefully is the place that you want to apply to. What is the application process? So some of you may well be have, entering year 13 and, and applying very shortly. And some of you might be a bit earlier on have, still thinking about the process itself. So if you're a bit earlier on, then you need to think about the preparation for your application. And that is one thing about medicine in comparison with lots of other degrees is that there is that thought process that needs to go on about why do you want to apply to medical school? Get some work experience, which I'll talk to you about in a bit more detail. Make sure that you have the right GCSEs. So for UCL, that's just English language and maths at grade six. Make sure you're studying the right A-levels, which we need biology and chemistry and that you do some wider reading and that you start developing those skills, attributes and behaviours that are necessary to work in a healthcare setting and to then be able to demonstrate them within your application and that interview. 
So the applications are by the 15th of October by UCAS. Um, so if you're doing that now, best of luck. And you also need to complete the biomedical admissions test. We don't accept UCAT. Um, the BMAT currently is taken in one sitting. This year it's on the 18th of October and you have to apply by the 30th of September. But keep an eye on the dates because they do vary each year. And the last part, well, we then look at your application and I treat this as a bit of a hurdle based system. So if you meet our minimum entry requirements, so looking at GCSEs and A-levels that you're predicted in A-star and two A's with your A-star predicted in biology or chemistry, you then get onto the next stage, which is we look at your BMAT results. Um, and if your BMAT results are good and within our our top number of students ranked that can come to interview, we will invite you to our multiple mini interviews taking place from March to from December to March. So the other thing to to think about is looking at information. And so there's lots of information on Medical Schools Council website about your application, how to apply, what to put in your application, thinking about work experience, thinking about interview practice as well. That is a, a single source of truth in a sense. Is It's created by medical schools for you. It's freely accessible. And I strongly encourage you to look at that website. So unfortunately, whilst I would love to be able to take all of you into medical school, we do have 4,000 applications every year for just 334 places. Um, and as you may be aware, those place numbers are capped by the UK government, so we can't go above that. And the cap also applies to international applicants. And so that is seven and a half percent of our cohort every year, which equates to 24 places. And we do have around a thousand applicants for international places every year. We tend to interview somewhere between 600 and 800 students each year, depending on the number of offers that we wish to make. And as I said, you need to meet that hurdle at the beginning. Make sure that you do meet our minimum academic requirements at GCSE um, and at A-level. It doesn't matter what your third A-level is in. So whether you choose maths, psychology, history, art, um, doesn't matter. As long as it's not general studies or critical thinking, that third A level is your free choice. So do something that you enjoy, but you must study biology and chemistry. Um, and we do have a contextual offer scheme. So if you are eligible, so you have to put in your postcode and your school into our eligibility checker on our Access UCL website, and that will let you know whether you are eligible for this offer. And so that is two grades lower at AAB with the AA in biology and chemistry. So you can apply to us with that lower grade prediction. The biomedical admissions test, so you must take that in the year of application. Um, so we don't accept scores from previous years. As I said, it's the 18th of October this year, um, and our average scores are posted on our website for the last three years. Um, that is um, an indication to you. So as you will see from those scores, they do vary every year because it is a different cohort of students. We only are able to publish the, the scores for students who apply to us, so it's not the scores from across the country. And obviously that cohort does vary every year and, and how many students get really top marks and how many students get lower marks down. Um, and so take those as a, an indication. It doesn't give you an idea of whether you'll get an interview or not with your score, um, but it does give you an idea of, of some of the scores that are, are attained by students who apply to UCL. The scores will be ranked, so if you meet our minimum entry requirements, we will then look at your BMAT scores and we will rank students. We rank home students and international students independently because there are different groups of students. And then we will choose the top students to come to interview. I would suggest that you look at the BMAT website, the Cambridge Assessment website for the past papers. They've got all the past papers stretching back to when it started in the early 2000s. They are freely available to download. And I would suggest that you do them in a timed fashion so that you know what it's like to do the number of MCQs in that short period of time and to do a timed 30 minute one page essay. And then that is the best way to prepare. 
There are reimbursement costs for, for some candidates who are eligible, um, and so do have a look at that if you find the cost a little bit prohibitive to you. And these are the average scores that are on our website. Um, as you can see, they do vary every year, um, depending on um, how students have performed in the assessment itself. But there are three sections there for you to look at and just have a look on our website because you can then have a look at the scores there. So how do you prepare for your application? Um, so think about your academic potential. Think about work experience that you have done and work experience doesn't have to be in a hospital or in a healthcare setting. It can be that um, work experience is your paid job, that you're learning how to work with people in a team, that you're communicating, that you're developing the skills and attributes that are necessary. We also think about um, your understanding of the career in medicine. Do you really know what it entails, what the training involves? what the challenges are of a, of a career in medicine. Um, and that comes to your motivation as well, is why do you want to do this? What has particularly driven you to want to, to choose a career, a vocation, rather than to study a degree? Teamwork, leadership, communication skills, those are all important values that are needed for medical students. We also hope that you think about your work-life balance. That's incredibly important as a doctor. It's, it's an intensive career um, and it is important that you have something outside of medicine and healthcare that you are then able to, to do other things and be a well-rounded individual. And also thinking about coming to university. You are changing from school to being much more independent and thinking about your reflective practice. So whilst we don't use your personal statement as part of the selection procedure, it's still an important part of the preparation. And I would use that opportunity to think reflectively about all of those areas and think about how have I developed myself as an individual to help me demonstrate that I have those skills and attributes to be a doctor in the future. And that will also help you with your interviews as well. So work experience, we know that it has been challenging for, for people. I know that some hospitals, for example, UCLH, are only just starting up their in-person work experience programmes again. And so every medical school understands that. Um, and we will take that into account. And every applicant will be in the same position. As I said, there's no minimum requirement for work experience. There's no minimum to have clinical work experience at UCL. Um, and so it's more about the quality than the quantity. So it's about the way that you reflect on those experiences of how they gave you an insight into a career, into the types of things that you would be doing as a doctor, and to think about um, what uh, it is like to care for other people. So volunteering is fantastic. Tutoring is great. Um, think about online opportunities as well. There's lots of virtual work experience these days that's developed that really gives you an insight into what it is to see a patient. Um, and the guidance on Medical Schools Council website is very helpful. So the interviews themselves. So we will invite interviews on a invite candidates on a rolling basis through from the beginning of December to the end of March. Um, so don't panic if you've not heard anything by February. We are still inviting people as we go along. This year, it will be a multiple mini interview format. So we are still um, working out the number of stations and, and the format exactly. It's likely to be somewhere between six to eight stations, probably at a five minute length. But when applicants apply to us in op October this year, we'll send out some further information to them with all the details of what will be happening, as well as some example questions. And so what I would suggest to you is that you have a look at NHS values, that you look at their values-based recruitment, and that you use the resources that are freely available on Medical Schools Council website. Don't over-prepare. Um, the worst thing you can do is learn lots of answers to questions. And um, the best thing that you can do in an interview is to be yourself and to just demonstrate to us why you want to do this and what research and preparation you have done for your application. Just so that you're aware, if you're an international student, we will be doing all of those MMI interviews online, whether you are in the UK or whether you are overseas. Um, so interview preparation. So, Demonstrate your interest in healthcare. 
demonstrate and show your motivation for a career in medicine. We do think about problem solving, your ability to reason, the exploration of professional skills and values, thinking about integrity, empathy, honesty, compassion, conscientiousness. How have you demonstrated those already? What do you do at school? What do you do outside of school that perhaps shows that you, you have some of those attributes already? Think about examples of working in a team, being a leader, what you know about that in terms of healthcare settings, what resilience is all about, and your individual strengths and weaknesses as well. And practice your communication skills. Think about what makes um, for a good interaction with your interviewer. So my advice. Studying medicine is tough. It's lengthy. It's six years. It is a lot of training that happens after that. But go for it. If you think that caring for other people and having an interest and understanding in healthcare is what you want to do, then go for it. Carefully read our websites. It's really important that you understand what the different entry requirements are across medical schools. And look at Medical Schools Council website too. Keep up to date. We're bound to ask you about things that are currently topical in the news. Um, and so show that you have an interest in what's going on in healthcare. Reflect on what you already do because you do lots of great things that are already giving you lots of skills and experiences. Do the BMAP papers in a practice timed way. Um, and remember, it is competitive. There are a lot of applicants per place. You might not be successful the first time around. You won't be alone if that is the situation. And if you really want to do it, apply again, go through a graduate route, think about the other entry options that you have into medicine. And don't forget that there are 350 different careers within the NHS. There isn't just medicine, there are lots of other things. And as doctors, we value and, and need all of those other careers to help us practice for our patients. So thank you for listening to that. Um, I can see that some questions have come up there that we can perhaps answer live and just clarify some of those things. But if you want some further clarification, please do put some questions in the Q&A chat. And there are some websites there looking at our website, the Medical Schools Council website, Health Education England for values based recruitment and NHS Health Careers as well. Fantastic. So I saw that there were some that were answered, but I know that perhaps we want to answer some of those live as well. Um, so in terms of ranking BMAT, um, for interview selection. So I can see that, that Amy has kindly answered this already from the admissions team. Um, but as I mentioned, it's a hurdle based system. And so if you meet our minimum entry requirements, you get on to the next step, which is us then ranking your BMAT scores. Um, and we will do that for home applicants and international applicants um, separately. Um, and then we will choose the top 800,000 applicants to come to interview depending on the number of interviews that we are doing and the number of offers that we are going to be making. And um, so all of the, the BMAT scores, as I said, the average scores are on our website at the moment. Um, so the minimum entry requirements must be A star in biology and chemistry. Uh, so A star in biology or chemistry. Um, and that is that is absolutely right. So you need to be predicted that to meet our minimum entry requirements. Brilliant. So um, let's see what types of qualities make an applicant stand out. Um, so I'm, I may come to Faye for this one, if that's all right. Um, just for your opinions on what makes a good medical student. Lovely. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. Great to see people on the chat and very exciting to think some of you are going to be future UCL medical students and UCL doctors. I think Dr. Bennett's covered a lot of this, but really what we look for and what's outstanding to us is somebody who's real, somebody who has a grasp of what it's like to be a medical student and a doctor, somebody who's, who's authentic, um, who's maybe done some good work experience, who understands some of the rigors, who's gonna be a good colleague for us in the future. So I look at somebody and I, I hope they're gonna be a future doctor who'll look after me or my family members. 
Um, you'll hear from some of our students shortly, and they really exempl exemplify some of the qualities that we look for. Um, so, yeah, have, have a go. We'd love to see you. Brilliant. Thank you, Faye. And just remember that we're not looking for you to be cooked um, and ready to be a doctor at the age of 18. We are looking for somebody who has the potential to develop those skills further, that you have some insight into what you're getting yourself into. Um, and I think that that's really important at interview, that you have some humility, that you have some honesty about what skills you've developed um, and how you see yourself developing further in the future. So I'm going to come to our medical students now, so Abby and Isabella. Um, so Isabella, you're going into year two, so can you tell us a little bit more about year one of the programme at UCR Medical School, just a brief outline of what it's like? <clears throat> so um, in year one, I believe we had four modules, which was foundations of health and medical practice, um, infection and defence, circulation and breathing and then fluids, nutrition and metabolism. And I'd say those sort of bridge the gap between A-levels and like a medical school course. So personally, I found that a lot of what was, what was taught in the modules, we had briefly touched upon in biology A-level, but then it was expanded on and like, you're seeing it in like a medical context. Um, overall, I'd say year one is more so, at least for me personally, I found it a time to like find my bearings and like find my feet. Um, we had like personal tutors and transition mentors and like rums, mums and dads, and they all sort of aided you into medical school. So it was just like a starting, like a, the start of the race. So that's what it feels like. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I hear that you've been doing some football pre year two. So perhaps tell us a little bit about why you chose to join the team. Um, so in first year, I actually went to um, one football practice session, but I was <laughs> really shy. So I was like, nope, I'm not going to go again. And I switched to um, dance. But then this year, because I really do like the support system that like RUMS football and RUMS teams and societies provide. So I was like, I'm going to try it out again. So I went to a few sessions and I actually just really like it. Um, I've met so many old years who just have like a lot of advice or they're willing to be like a friendly face around campus. And honestly, the social life is just, it's really great. I feel like being part of like a team like that, you sort of think in your brain, it sort of stops at secondary school, but then it's nice that it continues into uni and like I'm able to contribute to the uni, not just academically, but also in like a physical and I guess prideful way, you know, showing my UCL passion and stuff like that. Brilliant. Thank you, Isabella. There are loads of opportunities to join teams, to take part in other activities outside of medicine. Um, so RUMS, the Royal Free University College and Middlesex Student Society, um, is a big part of the community at UCR Medical School. Um, and it's not just about sport, it's about lots of other activities as well. And, and that support and peer network um, that students have. And so all students are part of the RUMS community and um, can take part in those activities. And we strongly encourage you to think about trying something new. And um, that's the great thing about coming to university is that there are so many new things out there. And we don't expect you to be world level, county level, school level even. You can be brand new to it. As Isabella said, trying something new is brilliant. Abby, what are your experiences of, of RUMS? Can you tell us a little bit more? Um, so my first year was completely overtaken by COVID. So we didn't have a lot of experience with RUMS in first year. Um, but in second year, it was a little bit different. Things did start to open up a lot more. I personally haven't joined any clubs yet. I do plan to join women's football and hockey this year. So I am quite excited for that. Although I have had a bit of experience in terms of the academic side of the RUMS societies and clubs. So not just sports, they offer academic support as well. So especially around exam times so or summatives, um, they'll offer tutorials. So the older years, the typically fours, five and sixes, they'll offer student led tutorials on the different um, modules that you have within first year and second year. And that can be so helpful because they've already gone through it all. They know what they're talking about. They know what they're doing. So it's lovely to just have a little refresher and get the information from a student perspective as well. Um, 
and when you do go to the clubs and societies and sports night and things like that they're always there to offer a hand um I've been to a few sports nights and they're all lovely if you need anything they're always there to help you so it's just a very big community it's not a competition it's not seen as oh we're going to be doctors in the future we're going to be competing against each other it's not like that at all everyone's so lovely and welcoming so it's just great that's great to hear thank you Abby and you're going into your IBSC year so could you tell us a little bit more about your choice and why why you chose that BSC so I picked the sports and exercise medical sciences IBSC for this year um so in first year and second year you get to do an SSE so a student selected component and that's just where you have a little bit of free range for I think it's about eight weeks in both first and second year in first year it's second term in second year it's first term you get to pick a different module so they're normally more specialized based so I know you can do one in I think you can do one in cardiology obviously I I chose one in first year to do one in sports and exercise medicine and I really loved it I just loved how it was run I loved the content of it um and they said that some of it was similar to the BSc or well, IBSc so I did decide to pick it and it was also my non-med choice um when I was applying to university so I knew I already had an interest in it and the fact that I could pick it for an IBSc was even better because it's the best of both worlds um so I'm really excited to start that next week brilliant thank you Abby yes it is the start of term next week we have 329 students joining us next week in year one which we're very excited about Isabella may I come back to you so we often have lots of questions about accommodation and particularly as you're in central London can you tell us a little bit more about where you've been living okay so for the first year I lived in Langton Close which is one of the UCL halls and it's about like a 20 25 minute walk away and for the second year I'm going to be living at home because I live in Camden with my family so not really a point for me to move out but um yeah I honestly really liked living in halls I felt like especially for first year, at least for me personally, it's a very unique experience. You can't really get a situation where you're just with a bunch of random students living away and like, I don't know, starting an independent life. And I found halls really nice because sometimes being a medic, because your timetable can be a bit more intense or like a bit more in person, it's easier to just get sucked into having only medic friends and only like seeing the world from a medic point of view. But then in my flat, everyone happened to be international students and everyone did like more so humanities based courses so now I've got friends who do history and friends who do politics and it's just like when I sit with them and they're all talking I'm just like looking back and forth and taking in all this information so it's nice to have like a break from just that medicine sort of environment and just learning like independent skills I guess motivating yourself to actually wake up and do things and navigating London by yourself is just a really good skill for you to have. So yeah, I do recommend if you do apply to UCL, living out for first year if you can. But going back home as well, I haven't felt left out so far. It's still very like easy to come to campus and find things to do. Brilliant. Thank you, Isabella. Yeah, so if you um, have not um, been in university accommodation before, you are guaranteed accommodation in your first year if you would like it. Um, and that is that's great um, and the accommodation is across London so it can be as far out as zone four or zone five um, and so there might be some traveling that's involved they're not all around the campus but actually that can be quite nice you're mixed in with lots of other students as Isabella says um, I lived with loads of other students in my first year in halls up in Camden um, but it was great and it really introduced me to other areas of London as well which was fantastic um, but we do have a lot of students who live at home as well. And so commuting is not a problem. Um, and it doesn't mean that you can't interact with everybody and take part fully in university life. Um, I had a lot of friends who commuted when I was a student too. Um, and they came out with us in the evening and joined us at the weekends. Um, and so it is absolutely possible to do that. So that leads me on a little bit to, to finances. So Abby, um, we often have questions about living in London and it being lots more expensive than anywhere else. How have you found it? So I actually do commute. Um, so I can't personally speak for the rent and factoring in all the little things that students living in London do have to pay for. But I can explain it from a commuter's point of view. Obviously, you do have to factor in your train fees or your bus fees however far out you are depends on what you need to get and it can be 
bit pricey, especially now with everything going on, things have gone up, but it is definitely doable. Um, depends on your student finance situation, but I know that UCL also offer bursaries and scholarships, so that could be something for people to look into if they do need to. Um, but I would say that there are definitely student deals around. Um, I know that with an Oyster card, you can add your 16 to 25 rail card. Um, so that could be helpful for a lot of people. It saves up to a third on fares. And in general, if you're commuting from further out, it can help with that as well. But around London in general, I would say it's relatively student friendly, especially weekdays. A lot of places do student deals along Tottenham Court Road, which is near where the uni is. There's so many different restaurants and different bars and stuff that offer student deals and student nights. So they're definitely things to take advantage of. If you do choose to live in London or if you do choose to compete, whatever you do, you'll make it work. You just have to find deals and make sure you're savvy with your money, I suppose. Definitely think, think of things like budgeting. If you do need more money, a potential for a part-time job might be there or just working around campus in general. They have little jobs, things like this that we do. Um, but yeah, you not, living in London will not make you broke. I know people like to think that and it does get said a lot but as long as you're smart with your money you'll be completely fine you don't have to not have a social life um to live in London you can do everything that you want and be okay thank you that's really reassuring Abby thank you um Faye may I come to you just to to highlight some of the scholarships and bursaries that are available to students when they come to UCL Yes, we've got a pretty wide range. We, we realise that it's very expensive to undertake a six year degree in London, as Abby spoke about. But we have a whole range of scholarships and bursaries, either through UCL or through UCL Medical School. So you're welcome to apply for them. I think lots of students receive these. They're very helpful for people. They range from hundreds to thousands. Um, and so we always want to hear from students who are in any sort of financial hardship because there are ways to help them and we do advertise those through our websites. Brilliant, thank you. And some of the, the medical um, funding agencies, things like the BMA, the Royal Medical Benevolent Fund, they do have funds for medical students to apply for as well. Um, and so there are ways and means of, of assisting your finances whilst you're at university as well. Um, and so do find out more about that. Have a look on our UCL finance website, on the fees and funding website. It talks about the average amounts of money that people pay for accommodation um, and for living costs. Um, and so it can just give you an indication of the, the sorts of costs that might be needed whilst you're at medical school. Um, the only costs that you need to think about is buying a stethoscope. That's important, making sure that you have some smartish clothes to wear when you're doing clinical skills activities. Um, and certainly when you get into clinical practice and you're going into hospital and community settings and seeing patients. And of course, there is a little bit of travel that is involved at medical school. At all medical schools, you're not based just in one hospital. You're based across a variety of different campuses. So we have three campuses, the Royal Free, the Whittington and UCLH. So you'll need to factor in the funds that are needed for that, although some people do cycle. Um, and we do have the, the cycle scheme in London. Um, and we do have hospitals that are outside of the M25 as well and general practices too. Um, but again, if you get an NHS bursary towards the end of the course, um, then you will have that funded um, as well. Brilliant. So Kate has just reminded me that we have 15 minutes to go. So if you've got any burning questions that you would like to ask our medical students about their experiences at medical school, please do pop them in the Q&A there and we will answer them for you. Um, I'm going to come to, to Arun now to answer a question. So Arun is the, the Deputy Programme Lead. Um, there are often questions that people ask about assessments, and I wondered if you could just give a bit of a flavour of the types of assessments at medical school. Um, OK, thank you. So we have a variety of um, assessments, but essentially they they split into two general types. So there are the written type uh, um, exam questions 
um, which are the ones that you're probably most used to um, going through your GCSEs and your um, future A levels. Um, and they tend to be either what we call a single best answer, where you are given a, a question and then some selections of potential answers and you have to choose the right one. And there are some other ones where there are um, mini responses or even drag and drop to, to show where the correct label is or, or the correct order of things. Um, and uh, as you go through your, your uh, medical degree at UCL, then the single best answer but, um, star becomes the one that's more uh, common because uh, that's the one that's used in higher exams. And then the other type is what we call a practical exam, um, uh, an OSCE or, or a, an OCARP or a clinical and practical skills assessment, but they're all really varieties of the same thing. And that's where you're given either five or 10 minutes to perform some form of practical skill. And, and usually that's based around some clinical skill. So it might be, um, for example, taking a small bit of a history from a patient with a particular uh, condition that's relevant to something that you've been learning in the year or performing an examination or doing some form of communication skills. And you're watched by an examiner uh, who doesn't really do very much in the way of asking questions, but observes how you're doing. And then and they have a checklist and then they will mark you against that. And, and then uh, after five minutes uh, or 10 minutes, then the bell will ring and you go on to a, a next one and perform a, a circuit. Um, but the important thing is that you'll have lots of practice at these. Uh, so we don't just throw you straight in and the first time you do it is the real exam. We have lots of mock uh, exams for the clinical and um, practical type uh, exam. And we have lots of mock questions that you can, you can practice on uh, that we provide on our website. Brilliant, thank you very much, Irene. That's really helpful. Um, it's, I suppose it's important to also say that there will be a medical licensing assessment that students will be taking um, who enter medical school from now onwards. There's that starting in 2024-25 academic year, where all students in their final year will take an assessment that is set um, about that all students will take um, to get your GMC license to practice. Um, and so you will get lots more information about that as you go through medical school. The key is not to worry about them, um, is that exams are always, always going to, to produce some anxiety um, because you want to do as well as you can. Um, but we have a very, very, very low um, attrition rate from medical school students do really, really well. Um, and so the key is to ask for help and seek support where you need it. So there is a question in the chat. How did students prepare for their interview? Isabella, can I come to you first for that? So how did you prepare for your medical interviews? Um, I think mainly like before you do apply to the uni, you should hopefully have like a, a vague idea of why you want to apply there. But I guess just, in, at least for me sort of formatting that in your brain and getting a bit more specific so finding out specifically more about the course what specifically does this uni offer for example UCL offers um, dissection and prosection and then some other medical schools don't it's just finding out what you sort of want and then seeing if the school you're applying to aligns with that and then I'd say keeping up with general news especially because at the time I think there was a lot of like COVID advances going along. So there was a lot for me to read about and just making sure you stay on top of it, on top of it. But um, honestly, aside from that, I don't really remember what I did. I guess I went through like the vague questions and just not memorizing any answers at all. Because as I think Dr. Bennett said earlier, that's not really helpful, but just, I guess, making sure your delivery is okay. You're speaking clearly and confidently and yeah, sort of the soft skills, but yeah. That's a really helpful answer. Thank you, Isabella. Abby, how about you? How did you prepare for your interviews? I was definitely similar to Isabella, but also just making sure that I knew my personal statement inside out. Um, everything that you write on there will be fair game in an interview, even like the tiny little bits you might not remember that you wrote. Um, so it's better to be prepared and just know your personal statement and what you've spoken about, just to make sure you don't get caught out as such, because um, it might not reflect well on you if you get asked a question about your personal statement um and you can't remember writing it or if you've mentioned a particular book not remember reading it or little things like that it's just important to know know your personal statement the four thousand characters that you wrote make sure you know it definitely clued up on it just to keep yourself safe brilliant thank you that's very helpful 
Um, Arun, you have your hand up. Yeah, I have. And I think it's probably just worth saying that we're not trying to catch people out at interview or trick you into saying the wrong thing. What we're really trying to do is to scratch below the superficial bit that we get from personal statements and 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 exam results and try to find a little bit about out about you, which is, you know, are you a caring person? Can you communicate? Do you really understand what medicine is about? Do you do you, you know what is it that makes you want to do that? Um, because it's a big step and it's a wonderful career, um, but it it does need a certain sort of person. And and I think as as um, Professor Gishan has has already said, um, we're looking for future colleagues and potentially future pe people who are going to look after us in our dotage. So we very much want to make sure that we have the right people that come along. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, yes, because we we all are on those interview panels. We've been there and now we're on the other side, which is great. Um, but we are we, we are trying to catch you out. We are just trying to find out a little bit more about you and what you understand about a career in medicine. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so someone has asked about the EPQ, um, so the extended project qualification. Um, so if you are doing that, that's great. Um, Again, think about what skills that is giving you by doing that. You can acquire those skills in lots of other ways by doing massive open online courses, by thinking about reading and wider research activity as well. We don't score the EPQ and we won't make an offer based on the EPQ. But anything that you do, remember that we're not trying to tick a box here to try and get a score so that you, you are the the right person. Um, we are looking for you to do these things to help develop you as a person and, and to think about the skills and attributes that you are developing as a consequence. So if you are doing an EPQ, that's great, but just think and reflect on what you have learned by doing that. Um, and another student has asked about whether we are using personal statements. No, we're not. Um, and that is very similar to a lot of medical schools across the UK, is that we are not using the personal statement. We're not scoring it as part of the selection procedure this year. So if you meet our minimum entry requirements at GCSE and A-level or equivalent, then you will get onto the next step, which we will then rank your BMAT scores according to those that have applied to us and will invite the top scoring candidates to interview. Great. Uh, Professor Gishin, have your hand up. Thank you. I was just gonna say, really resonate with what Abby said. Although we don't use the personal statement to call you to interview, it is a really useful exercise in sort of focusing down and reflecting on why you want to do medicine. So it's a very useful process to go through and it does make you really focus on what and why, and it will help you talk to, to the interview if you're called to, to speak to us at interview. So it's a very, very useful process. So it's not, it's, it, you know, it's, it, it is helpful. Brilliant, that's a really good point. Um, and medical schools may well use the personal statement as one of the MMI stations. Um, and so it is important to know what you have written. Um, Abby mentioned about wider reading and, and reading books, and we often get asked about whether there is a reading list. Um, there isn't. There isn't a reading list. The reason that people do the wider reading is to widen their knowledge of medicine and healthcare and to develop a further insight into caring for other people. There are loads of books out there that are written by doctors and nurses and lots of blogs. So if you don't like reading, there are lots of people who don't like reading books, that's fine. Um, read a blog, look on a website, um, re look at the television. There are lots of those fly on the wall um, programs that you can watch that again give you a bit of an idea of what it is like to work in healthcare settings, what the challenges are, what the good bits are as well. Um, but think about why you're reading something. It isn't to tick a box again, it is to develop yourself, it is to learn more about medicine and healthcare settings and if you have put one of those on your personal statement make sure that you are able to talk about it in in a way that is succinct um, and that shows your reflective skills as well. Brilliant. So we've got five minutes to go so I, I'm going to come to Abby and Isabella 
first and just ask them for their top tips for applying to medical school. So who would like to go first? Isabella, great, you go first. Mm. Um, I'd say my top tips are just making sure you get over the first hurdle and prioritizing that because that allows you to at least get an interview. So prioritizing your grades and making sure you meet the minimum requirements, uh, doing as best as you can in the uh, admissions interviews, because yeah, as I said, that is the first step to actually getting an interview. And then worrying about the other steps later on down the line, because I feel like, especially as med, aspiring med students, your brain can be full of all of these ideas and wanting to just do everything all at once, but just doing it in the order it comes to you slows down the process and makes it more manageable but also allows you to like keep your feet on the ground and not start worrying too early that's one of my top tips that's really helpful tip definitely abby i would say don't overthink it and don't compare yourself to others just from a mental well-being point of view the road to medicine is very long at the current stage right now you still have the rest of year 13 six years five or six years of medical school and then all of your training after that and you're going to come across so many hurdles you're going to be up against up against as such so many people there's no point comparing yourself to others um it will just drain you and overthinking it will also just drain you you have so long to go you don't want to get um burnt out at the first step it's just not going to be good for you and it's going to potentially make you fall out of love with medicine as well and make you not want to do it because it's just going to burn you out so the best thing I could say is to not compare yourself to others and just focus on your own journey um it just puts you in the right mindset for it all thank you so much I think that's really helpful advice actually um because you're right medicine is one of those degrees that is is competitive where students do compare themselves to how others have been performing and what they have done um and try as much as you can to avoid that and to go with your own pathway it is your own journey into medicine um, and enjoy it show us that you you will be looking forward to it and so to to add to that i think my top tips definitely are to do your preparation and research that is the, the important thing about med school is, is to make sure that you are well prepared, that you know why you're applying to medical school, why you're applying to that particular medical school as well, um, and make sure that you understand what a career in medicine really entails right from beginning through to end. And don't give up. That's the thing, is that it is a long journey. Some of you unfortunately will be disappointed and won't get a place, um, uh, but we get lots of students who reapply after a gap year or who reapply after they've done another degree or who apply after doing a completely different career at all. And that is okay. Um, and so keep going, persist, show us your motivation um, and enthusiasm and you will do really well. Um, and we look forward to potentially seeing you as our future UCL medical students. So thank you for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye.